So I think a good starting point is last week we did Eusebius and and Eusebius was clearly not a fan of Saint Athanasius. So what was what 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 do you think was the you know sort of major issue or issues between them? Eusebius liked the Arian person, so mm -hmm. that, that kind of was in between them. But I, I didn't get the why you say Eusebius was like that because didn't he believe in the incarnation of Jesus Christ? That he, that, you know, that he was both man and God. Thought he did, but I guess he did it in a way because he. I mean, I, I guess I would use the term "man and divine." Well, I, I use uh, "man" as and the father not necessarily because, because God. and Ignatius uses that that, mm. that lingo. He uses the word the word as, as God. Human and the world and the world, doesn't he? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I thought that was kind of the same thing. Well, the the hard thing is is you know in terms of Arianism or in terms of of something else. Um, so the Arian belief is. For Christ is that there was a time when he was not. Yeah. So he was presumably a divine being, a, a divine creature created by God. Then through him all things were made, etc. But but he was in some sort of sense clearly, you know, subordinate to God. Um it's 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 still not fully clear that although Athanasius not Athanasius, Eusebius was clearly sympathetic to that view, it's not clear that he actually supported it. But what he seems to have supported was that it's okay to have loose formulations because God is indescribable and incomprehensible. Although Athanasius would agree that this God is indescribable and incomprehensible. That doesn't mean that stricter formulations aren't necessary. That we can't be more precise or that we should be more precise and that we can't take the position that anything goes because theology and creedal statements and creedal formulations are important or else we end up not passing on the faith that it's been that has been handed down to us we end up passing on something else when he's willing to make compromises to you know keep the um oh his relationship with um constantine the Roman Empire. So he uh -huh. just kind of let them lead and take over some of the, the doctrine and all that. Whereas no way that um, Athanasius was going to do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Eusebius was willing to compromise with all sides of a dispute. Mm -hmm. And he was also willing to compromise with the emperor. And, and in many ways, I think you could say not so much compromise with the emperor, but do what the emperor wanted and try mm -hmm. to persuade the emperor to do what he wanted. Actually, in, in, I, I was struck in looking at that letter as I was doing our video on Eusebius, that he argued that Constantine had really been the 
the major leader, formulator, and driver of the creed only had a different understanding of the creed than the Orthodox school, but there's no actual evidence for that. It, it appears that what actually happened was that Constantine, Constantine's sole desire was that out of this emerge a united church. Right, so Constantine's interest isn't in theology, it isn't in necessarily theological agreement, it's in the ability to use the church as a united tool to form a single cohesive religion for the security of the state. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's the, and so within that context, he didn't care initially who won the de debate which side came out on top as long as everyone agreed and uh, the church could be used as a tool of the state. Mm -hmm. And so when the, ortho when the Orthodox side won, he exiled those who refused to embrace the creed, even though he presumably, he clearly didn't fully understand what it meant, although Eusebius said he did and had a different understanding of it. That Constantine had a different understanding? Or not, mm -hmm. uh, less full. Yeah. Okay. So he wasn't, yeah. So Constantine wasn't altruistic, he necessarily. Mm, no. no, I don't, <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I would describe him as an altruist. <laughs> Under any circumstances. Okay. No, no, he was certainly not an altruist. Yeah, I mean, he, he really, he was a tyrant. Oh, okay. For, from Eusebius's viewpoint, he had, you know, legalized Christianity and supported Christianity, and that made him worthy of accolades. Right. At, at, at all costs. Um, but for Athanasius, there's really only a single authority. Who oh, is Christ? And there can be no other. There is only one source of truth. There is only one truth. One truth is not debatable. Mm -hmm. And we pursue truth. I mean, I think in many ways for for him, you know, it was really that simple. And then if no one agrees or you get persecuted or exiled, you bear the consequences. So what about his on the incarnation? Any thoughts about wow. it? it was a big wow. I I haven't read all of it, but once I started reading it, it was like, this is amazing. It just, it flows really, it's easy to read. It just makes sense. It made me think that whoever would read it, if they hadn't been a Christian already, it just made complete sense. It would be a it would make make you believe or help you to believe. And I wondered too, was this translation directly from, did, did he write in the Greek? Was it the Greek that he wrote in? Yeah, he wrote in Greek. So this is a direct translation. The little introduction said that he was easy, he, he was easy to read. And if this is true to that, you know, it is easy to read. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there are a number. I, I'm not sure actually which translation this is. There are a number of them, mm -hmm. and um, many are simply bad translations. <laughs> many are have sort of been. Um, I guess you could say made less technical to be more popular, and many are more technical to be and 
be less popular. That's not the right word, but um, but in any case, um, what I tried to do is select what seemed to be uh, an easier to read translation as opposed to a a uh, more difficult yeah more difficult to read translation is also not a very very uh, good way of expressing it. Uh, poorly translated work is is the best way to express it. I mean, there, there are several things that I looked at that were, you know, sort of ch choppy, um, you know, adjectives were in the wrong place. There were a lot of hyphens and parentheticals where none seemed to belong and, uh, you know, witches and that's that didn't seem to agree with the thing that preceded them so you couldn't tell what witch or what that referred to and so yeah very very difficult to follow yeah. and very very confusing so this seems to me to be um, yeah a, a you really did you did well really good translation for the purpose so and it, it was very cohesive the chapters like I have, I haven't read much of it yet, but it's it's very cohesive, and the you know things that we've that we've heard during the mass, you know, all the the through the years and stuff. It just kind of brings everything together, almost like a a catechism in and of itself, which I think it kind of is. Yeah, there's a lot of scripture in it too. So it kind of follows from creation all the way through mm -hmm. his um, becoming man and surrendering his body to death to make death disappear. That's on page seven. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, he wrote this before the uh, Nicene Council wrote it before the creed wrote it uh, probably probably before the Edict of Toleration and he's still speaking about the martyrs so there's just you know he just wrote the truth of the word and it wasn't any defense on against Arianism in it yeah, Arius hadn't arisen. Arianism hadn't arisen yet. Right. Yeah. So. So I mean, what he's basically he's trying to. Um, I mean, he has, I think, three purposes. The first is simply to, you know, convey the basic theology of the incarnation the crucifixion and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And then the second is to uh, present an apologist to the, an apology to the Jews. Yeah. A defense of Christianity for the Jews and then a defense of Christianity for Gentiles mm -hmm. who yeah. were unbelievers. For the most part, I think he does all three really well. Mm -hmm. I was impressed with how strong he was holding to the faith through all the tribulations and trials, the terrible treatment he got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's... um. It's, it's sort of... You know, we tend to think that with the legalization of Christianity, that persecution stopped. But particularly the Arians and particularly um, particularly um, what, from the viewpoint of the Orthodox groupings, 
were heretical groupings were with the power of the state were very quick to persecute um, a number of the of orthodox leaders you know, so Athanasius is one <coughs> Chrysostom effectively was martyred. He um, he pronounced the empress to be a Jezebel, uh -huh. <laughs> and that you know wasn't wasn't appreciated. The um, so she, he was initially exiled, and um, he was enormously popular despite. <clears throat> rather, you know, sort of harsh preaching style. But uh, as Patriarch of Constantinople, he was enormously popular. So his exile was set off a revolt in which Hagia Sophia was destroyed. What oh, was destroyed? Hagia Sophia, uh, the, the central cathedral for the Patriarch in Constantinople. Oh, okay. Um, and then because of the revolt and unrest, he was brought back. But he, when he came back, he again pronounced the Empress to be a Jezebel. <laughs> and and uh, <clears throat> so then he was banished and tortured and eventually died. Um, St. Maximus the Confessor in the last of the really great Christological debates about whether Christ, whether Jesus in combining uh, the human and the divine had only a single will, the divine will, or both the divine will and a human will. And you know, the, the St. Maximus argued that Jesus necessarily had to have both a divine and a human will. Or we ended up really with a return to Gnosticism you know, at the very beginning, the very first Christian heresy. And uh, for that, his tongue was, was cut off and his eyes were gouged out. Oh he was you know, sort of exiled and he died in transportation to somewhere. Um, but uh, so, you know, the martyrs continue under the influence of state power, which, you know, should really help us to turn to the state to look at it as a source of protection for Christianity. And of course, I'm, you know, joking. Oh, how, how did his um, contemporaries regard this was were many in agreement or divide? Yeah, I think the the Isubius wasn't what's that Isubius wasn't in agreement oh yeah <laughs> we, we already let him go or, <laughs> no, but he was a pretty good guy he meant well right? he meant well he meant well yeah Maybe at, at this point, no one's talking about a, the Trinity yet, huh? but they recognize Christ and God and the Holy Spirit as three beings. Or well, people. they recognize the existence of the Holy Spirit, but it's still not clear how the yeah. Holy Spirit relates to Father and Son. Yeah, I I was almost yeah. getting a hint from. Athanasius that he was going to bring up the Trinity, you know, but he never mentions the Holy Spirit. He only talks about uh, Jesus Christ, the the human being, and the, Jesus Christ, the Word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was an obvious absence of the Holy Spirit. So, so I guess that kind of answered my question to myself whether he was going to bring it up at the Trinity. That there was there's a thing called the Trinity. Athanasius felt that Jesus Christ was a human 
and God or the Son of God. He felt that he was both. Yeah. Correct? Uh -huh. Not right. just being divine. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the hardest, that, that was a hard thing for people to grasp, I would imagine, that time. There must I, have been a lot of division. Yeah, I mean, I think the question is, you know, what does it mean? Mm. And well, he could um, do miracles as a as God in the human form. He could do more than what other people, what other prophets well, do. You know, I mean, yes and no. I mean, so things like healings and deliverance were you know sort of an expected part of the ministry of jewish holy men so you know um i mean they lack probably the you know number of miracles of healings and and deliverances that jesus did but nevertheless they were kind of an expected part of a jewish holy man's ministry raising from the dead was uncommon you know, in in the Old Testament. Only Elijah did it once, and Elisha did it once. Um, there's only one instance of multiplication of food, which I think Elijah did. So that's uncommon. Um, transformation of water into wine is is un, uncommon unheard of so you know the, the miracles themselves are suggestive but they're they're not altogether conclusive although you know they do point you know they certainly do point to a certain close relationship to God, but what that relationship is remains, you know, sort of somewhat foggy. One of the issues with the the early heresies is so the unfortunate thing is that heresies, you know, in some sense tend to recycle. Uh, so, you know, Gnosticism, for example, is is uh, you know is a heresy that's tended to recycle, even though it you know is fundamentally foolish. But in their earliest incarnation, heresies tend to attempt to address areas of vagueness or uncertainty or confusion within basic theology, or you know, well, yeah, basic theology is a good way to phrase it you know so who is jesus jesus was obviously a man so what is his relationship to god is he indeed the son of god and then how can he be man was he always god or was he promoted to god because of his, you know, good works, or because of his fidelity, or because of his loyalty to God, um, was he always in existence from pre from creation when the universe was created ex nihilo? Was Jesus? Is Jesus one of the things that was also created ex nihilo before everything else was created ex nihilo, which is what what uh, you know the Arians believe there was a time when he was not. And then we have, I mean, you know, the fact that there's a spirit of God or the Holy Spirit is, you know, clear from the create first creation story. In Genesis, the Spirit of God is hovering over the water. Within, in, in the wisdom literature in the Old Testament, there's also 
uh, wisdom, which is uh, appears to be in existence before the creation of the world. And so wisdom is the co-creator of the world along with Yahweh. So there are questions of what are these things? What is the spirit of God? What is wisdom? What is Jesus? What is Christ? And how do they relate to God the Father or to Yahweh or to, you know, one of those two formulations? And so those are, you know, all, all areas of, of murkiness. Well, Jesus was, <clears throat> Jesus uh, was a word. <clears throat> the word was in the beginning, was with God. So he, you know, that I'm sure they couldn't understand that. But... Well, but even there, John is going back, is drawing on Genesis. And and so in the beginning was the word. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. So in some sense, you can, you know, argue that John doesn't, in drawing on Genesis, John confuses the issue more than he he uh, he addresses it, and you know so. Um, I mean, I, I would argue that in fact that's not the case, but you can easily see how it is the case. Given first of all, I mean, it's not the case, largely because John is a mystic, and you know, a mystic tends to. look beyond physical realities to see profound spiritual realities. And so in the beginning goes to a beginning that has no beginning, which is a mystery and a contradiction. But if you're simply to take, you know, John 1.1 1, 1 in literal terms, that goes back to the beginning of Genesis. So the word pre-exists that, but how much does it pre he pre-exist it by? And in fact, the very notion of pre-existence simply means existing beforehand. But things, but in some sense, existence is a a uh, a mark of of creatureism, right? If you exist, that means you also cannot exist, and that means you're perishable. Well, they're they're just thinking on terms of what they can imagine, you know, based on anything alive that they're trying to compare. Uh huh. So well, it's you know. But that's that's. You know, that's sort of a natural tendency. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, we... <clears throat> now, that there's an argument. I mean, there was a, a really good sort of history of um, the Baptist and post-Baptist faith traditions in America um, written by a Jewish scholar who you know so most of the evangelical traditions have arisen in America which has really been you know sort of a hotbed for manufacturing you know denominations and, and whatever so the Baptists the Mormons the, actually I mean hundreds of them and so he argues that the peculiarity of them is that whereas in traditional Christianity and in, or in Orthodox Christianity and in Judaism, man is made in God's image, 
the peculiarity of American religions is that God is made in man's image. And, you know, if you look at them, then you see very much that God is made in man's image. Well, that's a God, big, yeah, it's a big problem is, they have. God is made as, you know, sort of servant. God is cast in explicable terms. The mystery of God is absent, largely absent. Can you give another example, Ron? Like, like, would it be like the prosperity gospel, like we put on to God? Yeah, the, the prosperity we... gospel is, is, you know, a really, is probably an extreme example, but an outstanding one, because uh, God's purpose, God, uh, God's purpose for existing is to enrich us, yeah, to make to... us rich. That is the goal and the purpose of the divinity. And um, it's, you know, it's a very first world view. It's a very racist view. It's a profoundly anti-Christian view. It's a profoundly idolatrous view. It's and actually a simple-minded view. <laughs> because they can't get beyond the idea and, that and, it, they and are. it's a, and it's a yeah. simple minded view right yeah i mean yeah. It, it seems like they just cannot get their mind beyond the idea that man is you know the center of everything mm -hmm. and and uh, they're they can't fathom a god that uh, they can't understand well, if God is for you, who can be against you? And of course, <laughs> God is for us because he wants to make us rich. <laughs> and who's in charge, huh? Yeah. Exactly. So there's a, I mean, what I, I'm sort of saying you know, is that there's a certain element of ambiguity. So in the early heresies that, um, you know, we should, however much, you know, we may reject them, we should, you know, kind of be, be sort of sensitive to, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to recognize that there's an element of ambiguity, you know, so the, the Holy Spirit is a really good uh, example, the Trinity is a good example of an area of ambiguity. In Judaism, though, wasn't the spirit of God recognized? Mm, yeah, the spirit of God is recognized, but then there again, there's a the question of what is it? How does it relate to, is the spirit of God the same thing as Yahweh? Mm. Is it, you know, so given the knowledge of the Trinity, you know, you can look at the first creation story in Genesis and, and see it as Trinitarian. But if it's Trinitarian, then how do you reconcile that with the Lord our God is one? And, and that's, you know, still isn't easy to do. You know, so for... Judaism, Christianity is you know theore theologically muddled because it has the Trinity. And for Islam, even more than Judaism, Christianity is really idolatrous because it has three gods instead of one. We assume that in a lot of ways that that the Trinity, that with the Holy Spirit, that the relationship between between Christ, God the Father, and Holy Spirit is obvious when you know, those issues have been been difficult to sort of hash out. And for those outside of of the Christian faith tradition, um, they're still not obvious. 
but back to Athanasius. So he, he places a heavy emphasis on human free will. Did everyone see that? Yeah. From the beginning, he did. Mm -hmm. And also from the need for the incarnation. Yeah, that was beautiful. So beautiful. That one of the things is that we could just repent, but repentance wouldn't be successful. Right. He didn't use the word weakness, but, um, oh, I guess one, once mankind had fallen, essentially, I think what he was saying, once mankind had fallen, there was kind of a, um, it was, it was unstoppable. The, uh, the evil that was beginning and continued, it had a momentum, I guess, it had a momentum of its own that it was, it was gonna, we were gonna self incinerate yeah. just by, just by virtue of, um, the momentum of it that God had to step in that God because he asked that question quite a few times what was what was God to do mm -hmm. you know was he just going to let his creation go after he you know what 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 would that mean if he did that or what what was God to do but in the end Jesus had to come and save us because that was to give honor, you know, honoring the honoring the God's creation, and we just couldn't be left. Alone. And then it gives us concrete example about a king in his kingdom, or a landowner just letting his property be destroyed and letting it go to whomever and whatever. We wouldn't just sit aside and let that happen. Mm hmm. No. It was beautifully done. Yeah. He says, nor does repentance recall men from what is according to their nature. Mm -hmm. All that it does is to make them cease from sinning. Right. Had it been a case of trespass only and not of a subsequent corruption, repentance would have been well enough. But when once transgression had be begun, Men came under the power of the corruption proper to their nature and were bereft of the grace which belonged to them as creatures in the image of God. Right. So we have man made in the image of God who nevertheless is separate from God and has a human nature which through grace is elevated but which can choose its own way, which denies God's grace or isn't affected by God's grace. Well, didn't he say that we were made incorruptible? Athanasius on the incarnation? Yeah. We originally were made incorruptible, but then fell to corruption through sin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so God became man and surrendered his body to death to make death disappear. The incorruption is also an act of grace. Mm -hmm. Originally, yeah. So God's grace is operative throughout. Mm -hmm. So then one of the biggest stumbling blocks in which he does a really good job of discussing is death on a cross. Why did Christ die on a cross? Especially since in Deuteronomy, cursed is he who hangs from a tree, mm -hmm. which is Paul's uh, actually rendition of Deuteronomy where, where it says you, you can't leave a, a uh, body hanging from a tree overnight because it's a curse. 
or the person is cursed, so he has to be taken down. But well, dying on the cross made a, a, a statement that he had he had to die for our sin and then made the resurrection and the people would know that he died and so it would make the resurrection more believable I guess if that's the wrong way of saying it it made it believable that he was going to be resurrected mm -hmm. yeah and there were a number of kind of other reasons as well one is that um he couldn't just die well they talked about how other prophets died and it it wasn't sensational you know some of them wasn't sensational yeah, yeah th that's probably the wrong word i mean something more sacred i think what he meant was that it, their deaths weren't very public yes that's it wasn't public um so he he cites Isaiah, for example, who, uh, according to the ascension of, of Isaiah, which was a apocryphal Old Testament work, um, Isaiah was uh, sawed in two when he went into hiding from persecution by the king. And so he hid him like a tree, and the, then the tree was sawed in two. Mm. Um, so he, it had to be public. He had to not die kind of an ordinary death. He couldn't die a death of his own choosing. He couldn't die a, uh, you know, sort of a death of convenience or it would appear to be no death at all. A death of his own choosing would be easy. Um, dying on a cross with arms outstretched symbolizes both being high and lifted up and a gathering of both Jews and Gentiles uh, so it has symbolic significance. It had to be clear he was dead as well as that he was crucified. So three days, the significance of the third day is that in Jewish tradition, the soul leaves the body and so this is this is you know, sort of later Judaism from uh, second century BC onward that after three days the soul leaves leaves the body and there's no possibility of revival. So in John's gospel, Jesus knows that Lazarus is dead but he delays his departure for Bethany so that he'll arrive like on the fourth day because he'll be incontrovertibly dead yeah. and beyond the possibility of bodily resurrection. And so there's that Martha who says, Lord, there will be a stench because he's rotting. He's not going to be able to be resurrected. So we have to have a crucifixion. We have to have a death. And the interval between crucifixion and resurrection has to be long enough <coughs> that it's clear that it isn't a mistake or incidental or an accident but rather that it is a resurrection. That's where the snake is, it's under resurrection. No one in his senses doubts the snake is dead when he sees, it's trampled under, sees it trampled underfoot, especially when he knows 
how savage it used to be, nor if he sees boys making fun of a lion, does he doubt that the brute is either dead or completely bereft of strength. These things can be seen with our own eyes, and it is the same with the conquest of death. Doubt no longer than that when you see death mocked and scorned by those who believe in Christ, that by Christ death was destroyed and the corruption that goes with it resolved and brought to end. Death had been slain by him. Mm -hmm. Then paragraph 32, it is indeed in accordance with the nature of the invisible God that he should be thus known through his works and those who doubt the Lord's resurrection because they do not now behold him with their eyes, might as well deny the very laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Going back to 30, dead men cannot take effective action. Their power of influence on others lasts only till the grave. Yeah. Deeds yeah, and good. actions that energize others belong only to the living. But Christ, who is dead and resurrected, continues to act on others, which is a characteristic of those who are not dead. He also, he also vaguely implies it, but never explicitly mentions it, that there were a lot of eyewitnesses who saw Jesus after the resurrection, or who had, like Paul, an encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, which was thoroughly transformative. And it, it transformed Paul from being a persecutor of Christians and a murderer into a, an apostle, an evangelist who spread the the good news of the gospel in a very you know with a great deal of fidelity even though he did it without contact with the other disciples at that point that only came later what about his apologetic toward to the uh, to the jews well they were supposed to be the ones that read scripture Mm -hmm. So should have seen this and the prophets foretelling the marvel of the virgin and the birth and the and Moses. Truly great one in whose word the Jews trust so implicitly, he also recognized the importance and truth of the matter. There shall arise a star from Jacob and a man from Israel, et cetera, et cetera, all sorts of quotes from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Isaiah numbers more Isaiah and Hosea he focuses on the suffering servant particularly in Isaiah yes he quotes uh, especially Isaiah chapter 53 yeah. like a sheep Psalm 22 they pierced my hands and feet. They counted all my bones. They divided my garments for themselves and cast lots for my clothing. Yeah, it's rich with all the scripture that the um, Jewish people would have known and read. They've got all this um, information mm -hmm. and all that. And then Paragraph 38, yet the Jews disbelieve this. Right. Yikes. That's the, that's the eternal question. How yeah. Could not, how could they not believe it? Who is this person that was made manifest? One might ask the Jews. If the prophet is speaking of himself, then they must tell us how he was first hidden in order to man be manifested afterwards. But no. What kind of man is this prophet? Oh, mercy. So, paragraph 40. So the Jews are indulging in fiction and transferring Whoa. time to future. Yeah. But why? <laughs> They're just holding on. Oh. Yeah. 
easy for us to say. Mm -hmm. In paragraph 40, which you were just looking at, mm -hmm. uh, like in the third sentence, he said, it is in fact a sign and notable proof of the coming of the word that Jerusalem no longer stands. What did he, does he mean by that? The temple fell, wasn't, wasn't it like 80 years or 60 years or something after the death of Christ? Uh, it was about 40. Uh, Christ died in either 30 or 33. And the temple was destroyed in 70. So either 37 or 40 years. So that's what he means. He is referring to the fall of the temple. Mm -hmm. the physical Jerusalem temple. does. Jerusalem. Jerusalem does stand. In fact, there's yeah. a, a bishop of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem. But at this point. So, so the temple was destroyed in 70. And then, and I don't remember, 140, 170, there was a second Jewish revolt that the Romans suppressed. Mm -hmm. At that point, it became a capital offense for a Jew to be in Jerusalem. So if you were Jewish and found to be in Jerusalem, you were simply summarily executed. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Jerusalem you know, ceases to be that remains as a city, but so in Athanasius's time, it ceases to be a Jewish city. And in any case, the temple is not there. Once the Holy One of Holies had come, both vision and prophecy were sealed. And the kingdom of Jerusalem ceased at the same time because kings were to be anointed among them only until the Holy of Holies had been anointed. Mm -hmm. Christ, Christ being the Holy of Holies. Uh huh. That's the only. It's only in this context that he uses the phrase. Yeah. Right. Um, the Holy One of Holies. Holy One of Holies. Top dog. Uh, Oops. So, <laughs> but contrast with the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. which no longer exists mm. and and you know since it's the only only way only place in which he uses the phrase uh the holy one of holies it's clear that he's referring to it as a replacement for the holy of holies so christ supersedes the holy of holies what about his uh, apologetic to the Gentiles? Well, they're worshiping idols. Uh-huh. But if those idols had really had power, then they would have prevented Gentiles from pagans from abandoning their religion and embracing Christianity. Yeah. Oh, which reminds me going back, he also focuses on the martyr. So he focuses on counterintuitive behavior. So martyrs embracing death mm. is a counterintuitive behavior. People are supposed to be afraid of death. They recognize that death is utter destruction. That when you're dead, you're dead. So, but in contrast to that, the martyrs embrace death. In contrast to, you know, seeing yourself as sort of um, you know, preserving some kind of immor immortality by procreating and passing on, you know, 
some element of yourself to your offspring. Um, men and women are celibate. Those are counterintuitive, which also reminds me. So one of Athanasius's earlier works was the life of Saint Anthony. Uh, so he, who was the desert father. And, and so the monastic movement originally developed with St. Anthony and others in Egypt. Mm -hmm. and, and so Athanasius did a biography of him and was always drawn to the right. monastic movement, um, although he himself didn't become a didn't withdraw into the desert like the other desert fathers but without him we probably we may not know of the monastic movement which became you know, very uh popular in in the west popular is the wrong word but became very important in the west especially with uh saint bernard saint benedict uh, with the various monastic rules, like the rule of St. Bernard, I mean the rule of St. Benedict. And then in terms of the apology to the Gentiles, he points to the paradox that if you reject Jesus as God and view that him as only man, how is it that one man has proven stronger than um, all of those who they re regard as gods, and especially one man who they think is dead. If he's thought to be a magician, how is it that through him magic is destroyed yeah. instead of being made strong? If he's a demon, then how could he drive demons out? That's really taken straight from the gospel. How the gospels, how can a house divided against itself stand if he casts out demons by Beelzebul? So we're out of time. Well, Mike, Aquilina's video about Anastasius, he said it's. Anastasius versus the world. You know, he wasn't going to compromise. He was willing to stand against Arianism. He was willing to, you know, write what he did on the incarnation and not, not a, was not um, accommodating the people who like and Eusebius wanted to kind of find a middle road mm -hmm. so that everybody would be happy that Athanasius would not compromise or accommodate so they called him irritating mm -hmm. and that's okay yeah he almost certainly was irritating <laughs> but, but uh well, that's, those who wanted to use their cause. That's, a, that's a, a strong point, not a, a weakness. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I wish there were more people like him nowadays. Yeah. He, he was a giant. I mean, wow. He, yeah. he really did suffer from people plotting him people in power plotting against him. And... Mm -hmm. Right. He was a giant. He did suffer. He he fought to preserve orthodoxy and, mm -hmm. and the, over the long run he won. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously along with a large number of other people, but Wasn't he considered but... the father of orthodoxy? By the Greek. Mm -hmm. Father of monasticism. 
too, right? Yeah. He was a bishop for 45 years, 17 of which he spent in exile. He was exiled five times. And our, our book says he he did have some peaceful years at the end. Yeah. He was restored to his office. So I must have not, he probably didn't care about feeling good. But that must have been, must have been a blessing for him. Yeah. No, I don't think feeling good was high up on his list. No, no. List of <laughs> that, was, that was a, a temporal reward for him. Yeah, exactly. Well, when he got to go off into the um, the desert for a while on his own. Mm. Yeah. Oof. It was next week. Ever had? Yeah. Who? Uh, perhaps the sage. the sage. He's a Persian father. 